Are you addicted to anything? Addictions can take control of our human behaviors and drive us to do things that are sometimes dangerous. How it's killed lots of people and ruined the lives of lots of people. Or sometimes addictions can have good results. It's just a completely incredible experience. Our guest today has an addiction. You be the judge, whether it's good, bad, or both. I think I'm just an addict. Like, I can't help myself. We at Mountain Meister know that getting away from it all is so great, as long as you make it back. With the Delorme InReach Explorer's tracking functions and its ability to trigger an interactive SOS in an emergency, you'll be in good hands on any journey. For $35 off of this crucial product, go to inreachdelorme.com and use the code MEISTER at checkout. You can find this deal and all others on our website, mtnmeister.com, under the deals section. Thanks to Delorme for supporting Mountain Meister, and thank you for listening to this episode, which starts now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Mountain Meister. Today with us, we welcome Andy Kirkpatrick, who is a British mountaineer, author, speaker, and comedian at times. Some of his more notable climbs include the Reticent Wall on El Cap, uh, the first winter ascent on the Troll Wall, and the South Ridge of Olvatana. Did I pronounce that right, Andy? Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> Olvatana in Antarctica. He is the author of Psycho Vertical and Cold Wars, both which won the Boardman Tasker Award for Climbing Literature in 2008 and 2012, respectively. Andy Kirkpatrick, welcome to Mountain Meister. Uh, good morning, or is it good afternoon? Not, not quite sure. Yeah, good morning still. It's uh, almost 11 o'clock here. How's your day going so far? Yeah, not bad. It's just a normal day of uh, sitting in a coffee shop and <laughs> trying to do some writing and getting distracted about sort of things. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> like I, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more of a, I'm like an indoor, indoor person, primarily, I think, who, who sometimes goes outdoors. Um, so it's kind of a strange, a strange life, really. That is interesting. I wasn't expecting a mountaineer to say that he's more of an indoors person. I guess, I, yeah, I guess, I guess like growing up, when I think about it, like I grew up in a city. You know, I, I, I spent most of my childhood watching television, probably. So mm-hmm. uh, I think I'm slightly, slightly strange in my kind of perspective of most things. Um, like I, I, I recently <laughs> described myself as like an assassin who didn't really like killing people. Like, um, like I'm not, I, I really, I really love adventures and climbing and everything else. But I also really love like writing and watching films and doing things that aren't in the mountains. Like sometimes, like I hang around with a lot of climbers, and to be honest, a, a lot of climbers are pretty dull people. Um, they have no, they have no interest in anything apart from climbing in the mountains. They have no, no cultural um, anything about literature or film or history. They can't talk about anything apart from climbing, which is, you know, it's kind of boring, really. You know, but climbing it's, it's an active thing, isn't it? Really? Yeah, it is an active thing. It takes weeks, sometimes months, even uh, to go on an expedition. Maybe sometimes people lose touch during that time. I, I like how you said you're at a coffee shop there. I, too, enjoy coffee shops. Uh, and <laughs> part of my job, I can spend a lot of time in coffee shops. What's the longest time in one sitting that you've spent in a coffee shop? Probably like nine in the morning till probably about like 11 o'clock at night, maybe. <laughs> I, I, I often work in like a cinema. There's a coffee shop there in Sheffield. It's a cinema. And um, it's a really good place to work. So people kind of leave you, leave you alone. But you do feel quite guilty um, I, I once worked out that if I'd actually worked in a coffee shop, I would be successful financially than um, sitting there <laughs> fiddling around. My son said he wanted to, when it when someone asked him what he wanted to do for a job, he said I want to do what my dad does. And so they said, "What's that?" I said, "He just sits in coffee shops <laughs> on the internet." So. <laughs> so you could spend potentially uh, earn more money working for the coffee shop for the time that you spend there than writing the book, depending on how yeah. the book does, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, But then, you, you, like, I, I met somebody the other day, and she was a cake. She made flowers uh, made out of icing that went on top of cakes. 
And she the, the, what she was making was absolutely incredible. And she was charging something like £40 for a cake with these beautiful things on it. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Like, how much does the cake cost? And she said, well, I don't charge for my time. Uh-huh. And I was like, how long did it take you to make those flowers? She said, oh, five days. And <laughs> but, she, but for her, the, the, the £40 was like a bonus because she actually loved making flowers out of icing. And, you know, she... So you can never charge the amount of time it takes. As long as you have enough money to do what you want to do, even if you're on like the, the bread line, um, it's enough, isn't it, really, to, to keep doing it? Yeah. Yeah, so let's figure out how you got to where you are today. I want to rewind back to your childhood. Uh, it sounds like you didn't have the easiest childhood, I guess, relative to some children, and then maybe it was easier relative to other children. Everything's relative, right? Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so what was life like in the Kirkpatrick family uh, in the early days? Well, I, I, I guess I kind of began with a classical, this person's become an adventurer. So I grew up, my father was in the military. He was one of these, like a PTI, physical training instructor. So he was like this kind of scary character who'd make you go swimming in the sea at six in the morning. And, you know, when I was, I remember when I was about five, I got washed into the sea on Christmas Day in a huge storm. And uh, so I had a very adventurous childhood. What, what do you mean you got washed into the sea? Well, there was a, my father took us for, me for a walk, and it was a big stormy, um, we lived near the Irish Sea, so there's this huge big storm. And you, know, you get like the, the, the jetty that goes down like a ramp into the sea, and you know, when the waves crash in and you kind of run up and run down. But I wasn't fast enough, and I got caught by the wave and dragged into the sea. And luckily, my dad was a really good swimmer, so he managed to, managed to save me. Wow. And all, all I can remember is having loads of... Um, uh, like sand everywhere, like in my nose, in my eyes, in my ears, everything was just covered full of sand. Uh, it was like a bit like a dishwasher. So, I, so I had this like childhood of growing up uh, near the sea, near the mountains, having total freedom. Like I didn't, I didn't have paedophiles in the nineteen seventies, so you could just you had this like total freedom to wander. And people, like in a way, like parents were um, uh, very neglectful. But you know that was that that made children who were very independent and they weren't in total, totally in fear the whole time that you're going to be snatched by some stranger or you know get TB or something or at the ball or something. So um, so we had this uh, amazing amazing childhood. But then when I was six, my parents split up and I went was taken back to live where my mother was from, which is a place called Hull, which is someone said it's like New Jersey. You, <laughs> that means um, a lot. <laughs> And it's like really quite a grim, like it made all its money. It was a huge city, but it made all its money through slavery and whaling um, and the fishing industry. And all three of them had all completely collapsed. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was an incredibly poor place. And even now, you know, like people said that the 60s didn't arrive in Hull till the 90s. Um, It it was this incredibly downtrodden place where even now it's voted the worst place to live in the UK as the lowest house prices, terrible obesity and everything else. Anyway, so I went to live in this block of flats there and the previous tenant where we lived had committed suicide. He'd hung himself in, the, in this flat. So no, nobody wanted to live in, live in it. So, so from, from almost, you went from this beautiful, idyllic childhood to be thrown to this kind of apocalyptic, you know, grim, uh, they were called the misery masonettes because they were they were leaky and moldy, and it was all, all really grim. You know, like people sniffing glue in the stairs, oh. and um, I think the trauma of your parents splitting up—that was that was one thing. But the trauma of being sort of cast out. Um, I think being cast out is a really important thing in a lot of people's lives. Like people are cast out from a relationship, like they have a, a like a timeline that they expect to live, and they're cast out from it. Like a you know, relationship breaks apart or they lose their job or they, they have things where they, you know, how they think life is going to be changes and they're forever trying to recapture it or feeling more or in mourning. So I think a lot of my childhood I was in mourning. Hmm. I didn't want to be in this place, but like all kids, you just adapt. Hmm. So you had a little bit of exposure to climbing through your dad, but you're basically climbing and writing about it as a career. Now, when did you find climbing? I left school without any qualifications because um, I was I just really struggled at school. I wasn't very good at anything, and um, I moved to London because there wasn't any work. And I uh, I got a job in a climbing shop. I remember going for the interview, and the guy 
I, I didn't really know anything about what I was, what I was supposed to be doing back in the climbing what shop. Age, what age were you at this time? So I was like, I was uh, 18. Okay, okay. Uh, and um, the, the, the manager was like, it was like this sort of broad cockney from London who also was totally clueless about the outdoors. He'd like come from somewhere else. He was like, right in, you're in the jungle. What do you need? I said, uh, a hammock. He went, you've got the job. So that was my, <laughs> that was my, inter- my interview. So, um, but then, but then working there, I suddenly went, I suddenly, I suddenly met all these people who worked in climbing shops who had like degrees or, you know, PhDs in, in art and all these different things. And, and you realize that maybe, like a lot of kids, they leave, they really believe that, that, that life is defined by school, like how you end your, your childhood at school, how you're marked or graded, that is going to set you for the rest of your life. It's just not, it just isn't true, but we have to kind of keep up this myth because otherwise kids would just not, would just slack off. But really, I think a lot of kids would be better just not going to school at all, just get them to do, do the things they love doing. Uh, you know, if they're into playing Minecraft, then just let them play that every single day and, <laughs> and they might learn a lot more than having to sit through, you know, a lot of other things. But um, yeah, so, so through that, like working in, working in uh in climbing in climbing shops like um, i'm a very obsessive person so i so i knew i ended up knowing quite a lot about gear and um and then meeting climbers and then started climbing properly like uh, climbing in the alps um when i look at the routes i did early on it's just totally in, in, uh, crazy like the, the the steepness of it it's like someone just never having climbed before and doing climbing El Cap and then climbing Denali next. And then, you know, like it so was, it looking, was... looking at looking back on it, were you prepared to do those? No, so I was totally, I was totally out of my depths. Like the, how I didn't die. Like someone said, I, I have a very, um, what do you call it? The laws of attraction. Like I don't expect anything bad to happen and therefore nothing bad happens. So I don't know if that's mm. true, but I, I didn't even, I wouldn't say I even enjoyed it because I knew how, totally out of my depth I was like I was really sketching my way up routes and um yeah having some like dropping like on the first alpine route we ever did the friend or spare in the in Chamonix which is about 1200 meters and it's the classic first hard route that someone does so you go to the Alps for a few years and you do all the classics easy routes and you build up and then you do the friend or spare and it's very long it's not that difficult but it's um it's very long and a lot lots of people have accidents on it and then that's the beginning of your your harder your apprenticeship into harder climbing but that was the first route i did and i did it in the winter time which very few people climb in winter and on the first attempt i dropped my boot off the bivouac um and then had to descend the next day with oh. one boot on and and went back and had this three-day epic on this climb and the guy I was with, uh, he never never climbed again. That was it. He just said that was as far as he ever wanted to put it, push it. And the point where for me, although I really hated it, I felt really um, just in fear the whole way. I also realised that I was quite I was quite good at it. And I think maybe my friend, he was he's just done a PhD in physics. He had a lot of he had lots more things going for him in life. But I was working in the climbing shop. I was on. You know, about ten thousand dollars a year. Um, I had nothing to live for. You know, I was just like, "This is it. This mm-hmm. is this is something." And also, I was I was quite good at articulating um, what I what I what I'd done, so I could come back and I was telling the story mm-hmm. in the in the climbing shop. And then I decided I really had this urge to write the story of this climb, and I tried. It took about two years to finish this uh, this piece of writing. It was called um, "Broken Promises." And at the end, it's about whether if I'd fa- not found my boot, whether I would have just like walked away from the from this uh, life ah. as, a, as a climber. And for, for some reason, I I used to think I had lo- low self esteem, but I've recently realised I don't have low self esteem, but I have a lot of doubt about myself. Um, and what I for some reason I just wrote the first thing I'd ever written, and I remember faxing it to Climbing Magazine in America, which is at the time was like the, the ultimate place to get your um your work published mm-hmm. which which now is probably alpinist magazine so i am sorry sorry calming magazine so i um mm-hmm. I, I faxed it to them which is really uh, quite bold me looking back and i remember coming into work the next morning and just seeing this rolled piece of paper coming out of the fax machine and when i opened it it was from 
uh, Alison um, Climate Magazine saying, uh, "We love this. We want to want to use it." And wow. it, that was that was m- more profound in my life than the climbing the route is about. The same as mm. writing writing books. The fact that book I have written a book is more impressive than any of the climbs in the book, really. Right. So you say you don't enjoy the climbing, at least during the climb. What keeps you going back? Is it this kind of this validation of proving to yourself that you can do it because of that self doubt? I don't, like it, it is. In, you, you're aware that this is the most. It's like a really pivotal moment in your life. A because you could die, you could die doing it. But it's just a completely incredible experience like i was when i was a kid i was obsessed with science fiction and this is the nearest you're ever going to get to uh, like being on the roof in the roof gorge in march in alaska mm-hmm. where it's minus 50 that is pretty close to being on a different planet um you know it's you are, you're in these places where you, know, you often have like almost like post-traumatic stress when you come back to the real world people just don't get where you've been you know they don't understand where what is what antarctic is like or what patagonia is like and you go into these these places where the sheer fear before you set out you know it's it's like horrible like the only reason to set out is the the way you'd beat yourself up if you if you didn't do it because you were too weak so what's the what's the difference between you the person who experiences this and keeps going back and the person like your friend who said i i've had enough like this is not for me i think i'm I'm just an addict like i can't help myself i can i have this i have this like tendency of um of being uh of being sponsored i get i get like i have like huge gaps in my climbing like months months and years without any climb whatsoever and it's this kind of love hate relationship where i re- i'm really aware of how destructive climbing is in my life and in relationships and how it's killed lots of people and ruined the lives of lots of people and um so i'll so i'll, I'll kind of get really really keen and then i'll get some sponsorship and then i'll sort of do some routes and then do something hard and then i'll start having doubts about what i'm doing and that it's dangerous and i imagine my kids crying and all this kind of stuff and then I was kind of, I'm probably the only person who ever like sort of ditches the responses. Like, you know, like, I, like several times I've just said, I don't want to be sponsored anymore. And just stop, like being sponsored by people like Patagonia and Berg House, people like that. And just just stop. And I think, well, that's it. I'm going to just have an ordinary life. I'm going to find other things to do. I'm going to take up sea kayaking or golf or something. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then slowly it just comes back again. It's like, oh, what about going to the troll wall or what about like, and, and then there's this part of it. It's like, don't, don't give in. Don't be weak. Um, like, like recently I tried to, uh, twice I've tried to solo the North Face of the Eiger by the, by the Harlan route, which goes up the middle of the Eiger. And it makes no sense. Like no one's ever soloed it. Um, Cause it's so, like a, a few people have said they've soloed it, but no one's actually, has actually soloed the whole route. People have like done bits of bits of it. But, um, Cause it's so long. It's you know, it's like nearly nearly two thousand meters or something. It's like a really really long mm-hmm. climb. So it's almost unsolvable, probably. And anyway, I've tried twice. Uh, I had this recollection the other day how the first time I tried, I was I was so ab- absorbed by what I was doing on this pitch that when I when I got to the top, I couldn't remember where I was. I couldn't remember like what mountain I was on or what country I was in. And uh, it was because someone was talking about flow to me. And I was thinking maybe that's like the ultimate flow where you just completely don't even know anything. But um, but when I was on the Eiger, I was thinking that, that this last time, so it was in, um, in March or February, and I was the weather was like really terrible. So I was on the Eiger for a week and it just snowed and I got buried alive like twice in the tent. And it was all, it was all very traumatic. And I kept thinking, um, apart, I kept thinking, why am I, why did I come back? Like the first time I, t- I came down and decided, I think I said like someone tell me never to do this again, many, but I somehow was back again. And I was thinking whenever I wanted to, to turn around and just run away, I was kept thinking you have to make a positive step upwards before before you're allowed to go back down. And every time I every time I do that, then I was kind of re engaged in the climbing, and I would sort of hang on a bit longer. 
and and I guess that's that's a bit like um, like like as a, as a professional. I wouldn't I wouldn't really call myself a professional climber because someone who's a guide or ski patroller or you know Alex Honnold or Cedar Wright or all these guys they're professional climbers because they climb like every, almost every single day. I think it's quite dangerous for a lot of climbers like Alex Honnold in particular where they're tied in their life is tied into making money from what they do mm. and if what they do is really dangerous you know compare it to like someone driving a formula 1 racing car you know that is that is like that is that is like super safe you know like these things that people think are dangerous these sports are not are not dangerous in the least you know the chance of you know of something bad happening is tiny but if you compare it to climbing you know it's just the, mm-hmm. it's yeah you know, it's incredibly hazardous for your life so when you when you I remember emailing Alex Honnold once, like, uh, and I, I don't know why, but I just emailed him because I kind of met him a few times about, uh, I did this like project and, um, you know, there's all these helicopters and people, cameramen in position. And uh, it just really, it really scared me that the idea that you'd wake up in the morning and think, I don't want to do this. Um, I don't want to do it, but I have to because all this money has been invested and in TV crews and everything else. So I told him how the Roman emperors, when they came back to Rome, when they'd had a great conquest, and they had all these thousands of people, you know, cheering them on. They'd have like a slave in the chariot who would whisper in their ear, "Remember, you are mortal." So <laughs> I felt, I felt, I don't know why, I, I don't know why I even emailed him, but I just felt like it felt like I had to say something, even though he, I mean, he, he's an incredibly intelligent guy. Mm-hmm. He, he knows exactly what's going on, but yeah. <laughs> Andy, I could listen to you talk for a while. You are full <laughs> of stories. Um, one thing that our listeners might not know about you is that you were diagnosed with dyslexia, uh, a pretty severe form of it. At, at what age? Uh, when I was 19. 19, okay. It was fairly fairly, fairly extreme. Um, you have these, in the UK, have these two tests. One's like a spatial test and one's a numerical test. Mm-hmm. And on the, on the numerical side, I had about, I think I had like 14, 15% right, which is re- really, really low. Like, you know, really low, like a, like a baby, like a five-year-old. And then on the on the spatial, I had like 99%, which is like, you know, off the scale for for that kind of thing. So, um, but I'd never, I'd never, my mum my mom always said I was just lazy when I was at school. Um, but I don't, I don't know if it's good to be defined by, it's who you are. It's the same as being dyspraxic or, Having um, you know all these things like when you that it's, like my my son that they they say he's got a attention deficit syndrome mm-hmm. and his mum is always telling saying like well he's got it from you because that's you know a lot of the things are the same but I call it like attention focus syndrome mm-hmm. like kids who can't focus are often incredibly good at focusing on things they're interested in but they're just not. They're just not good at focusing on on crap, basically. Right. Like, mm-hmm. So, um, like a lot of people I've, I've uh, climbed with, like incredibly successful people were just incredibly unsuccessful kids. Uh, they were just not very good at it. Um, but people went on to have, you know, you know, multi millionaires or people who were millionaires in other in other things, but from money. Uh, you know, they would have been classed as being disruptive or having no, poor attention at school. But it's because they were thinking about other things, probably more important things. Well, you play you play the cards you're dealt, right? And try to optimize whatever you have uh, to the best of your ability. When you try to, I guess, restrict the things that you're born with or the skills that you already have, uh, I think that's when you're held back. But if you're unique, uh, then maybe you can capitalize on that uniqueness. Yeah, definitely. I guess it's always a battle because his mum is an academic and I'm, I'm not an academic. <laughs> so I'm just like, like I'd love to just bust him out of school and go to America and do the Pacific Crest Trail or just hang out in Camp 4 for, you know, do do, do something completely different. Because mm-hmm. um, Ella, is his sister Ella, when she was 13, she climbed El Capitan. Wow. Uh, and that, that had a really, really positive effect on her, on her, on her life, really, you know, it was it was five days climbing El Capitan, but then she had sort of two weeks living in Camp Four, and it just made her change. Like, because climbers, like most outdoor people, 
you know, whether they're kayakers or climbers or walkers, they don't, they don't, you tend not to judge people like everybody else. You don't judge people on what car you drive or how much money you have. Like it's more about experience or you, you, you have more respect for, for human beings, I think, because you've, you've been to a place where it doesn't matter what, what kind of car you've got when you've run out of food, you know, mm-hmm. was that really, there's that really famous quote where there's some uh, famous, um, you know, intellectual is, is crossing the, uh, the Thames in London and um, uh, he's in this boat, and, and the the the, uh, the boatman is rowing the boat across. And um, the intellectual says to the boatman, "Can you read?" And he goes, uh, "No, sir, I I can't read." He goes, "That's terrible. That's terrible. A man of your you know of your age not being able to read." And then then the boatman says, "But sir, can you swim?" And he goes, and "He says, no, I can't swim." He says, "Well, the boat's sinking." So. Um, <laughs> But I think that that kind of taking your kids out of school, and I remember on the la- I think on the last night we were in, in Camp Four, uh, um, so Ella had climbed El Cap, and everyone was like, you know, being really nice to her, and um, and and everyone, in, a lot of people in Camp Four want to climb El Cap. It's like a big dream of people, but a lot of people just don't know how to do it. They know how to do it physically, but mentally, how do you approach something that's mm-hmm. that, that that big? Anyway, on the on the picnic table where we were, where we camped, there was a a guy who just left the, the Royal Navy, and he was the captain of a Polaris nuclear Polaris submarine, which is probably one of the most extreme jobs that's probably ever existed in the history of mankind. And anyway, he, he said to Ella, "Ella, like, how did he do it? You know." <laughs> so you know, this guy asking a thirteen-year-old, it's, uh, it's quite a, it's quite a, quite an amazing thing. But that, but that really changed her perception of herself. Like, she just, she has no need to self-harm or to date drugs or to do all these things that uh-huh. you know, 16-year-old kids do. Because um, she has, she, it was like a kind of rite of passage. And I think a lot of kids who do a lot of skiing or a lot of walking, a lot of mountain biking, they are a lot more grounded, aren't they, than their, than their peers. Mm-hmm. They, uh, they kind of have a better handle on what is, what, where the real value is. You know, their value system isn't based on how beautiful you are or how much money you have or anything else, you know, as long as they've got a bike and they've got a pair of skis. Yeah, I think it's uh, re- more, more, more rewilding of the kids. I think that's what we need, really. <laughs> <laughs> so would you like to see your kids become climbers eventually? So, so I think they have to live in the 21st century. So I think it's very important that they, they grasp technology and computers and, mm-hmm. and mobile phones and everything else. I'm not one of these people who says they shouldn't do that. Like they've got the McDonald's and... They do everything, everything normal kids do. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, to let them experience those things. Like, I, I do live in fear of them becoming climbers and mountaineers. Uh, I'd, I'd rather them get into something else, like triathlons or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> something, something safer. Something kind of extreme, but less life-threatening. <laughs> yeah, uh-huh. yeah. I think to maybe to have more more depth, really. Mm-hmm. Like, like, if you just have, like, climbing is, climbing and everything else is, is cool. It's good to have some other things you know i think as you get older you get less extreme don't you really in your views about most things like when you're you know when you're 19 you wouldn't talk to somebody if they weren't a climber like what's the point you know what they you know and, and uh, as you get older you start taking more interest in in uh, like the history of the climbs you're doing or uh, history in general and um so yeah the, the, the purely physical is less is, is not as important as it was when you're younger, like if you can't do something, it's not like the end of the world. Is that uh, true for you, though? I mean, you've done some pretty hairy climbs in the past few years. Um, I guess so. But I'd, I there's some sort of graph where, like, when you're young, you're, that's the time when you're most able to do all the most extreme things in your life. But you're the, the least able financially or time wise. And then as you get older, you have more opportunity to do those things, but yeah. then you start want, not wanting to do them. So there's a point when you're about 30, 35, when you can financially afford to go and climb in the Himalayas or in Patagonia and every, everywhere else. Um, and I guess for me, that's not, I'm still on that like, timeline where, uh, but, like this, but then this, this year I was, I was supposed to go, I was going to go and try and solo Denali in the wintertime. And due to, I had laser eye surgery um, before I went because I'd always had a lot of problems with my eyes um, and goggles and everything else in in cold places. And then I was told I couldn't go for six months. Um, I literally, 20 seconds after having the operation, he was like, when are you going to Alaska? I was like, oh, in in a month. He was like, oh, you can't go for like six months. And it made me think that, 
maybe that was like a suicide mission. Like it was kind of, I don't know, it was like 30, I think it was a 36% chance of dying, um, going to Denali in winter to solo, um, or just, yeah, 36% chance, even if you just went there with somebody else. So soloing is probably a little bit higher. So, so now having come back, um, I had like a few different things planned to do, but I'm feeling a little bit at the moment that my heart is is not in it. Like my heart is more into having a <laughs> having a good time, like doing so, like going instead of going to Alaska, maybe we should go to Tuolumne or you know, like go go and have some fun, maybe. But uh, but then you feel like that com feel compelled a little bit, like well, I make a living out of doing extreme things. Um, if I don't do them then i'll have to go and get a job uh that would be terrible this is know? quite the predicament it also sounds like you're in one of those waves that you alluded to earlier maybe such as life yeah mm-hmm. yeah i think it's if you have relationships with other people like you know girlfriends boyfriends whatever and climbing an extreme sport it's quite a big issue so a lot of people ask me questions about it and i often say that if you're having a problem in your relationship if you uh, forget marriage counselling, all those kind of things, they're a waste of time. Um, if you go on a holiday with someone, you know, someone you used to like, like your wife or your whoever, and you spend two weeks together, if you feel better at the end of it, and um, so but I think that's same with I think that's same with climbing. Like, and when you're thinking about it, when you're in, in the real world, um, it's much it's much harder to sort of really remember what you really love about climbing. Mm-hmm. But when you do, when you're actually doing it, when you're in on Denali or whatever, you know, because you imagine everything is the most extreme example of like on Denali in January in a huge storm. But when you're there and the sun's shining and you've got the Alpen glow and everything else, it's like, oh, wow, like why did they ever think this was going to be a bad, a bad thing? You know, this is like, it's like lovely. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I sometimes even experience that with the podcast. I'll like find myself not really looking forward to doing something, but then once I immerse myself in it, then I guess I realize what I – really like about it it's kind of funny how that works i guess it's i guess it's like cyclical and yeah. mm-hmm. like i've had i've had like a few um a few, i don't know if it's depression but i've had like some like really tough tough times and the way i kind of view it um is that it, it's just part of a cycle and whenever when you come through it you always have a, a real a real sort of bout of more inspiration and creativity mm-hmm. but you can't you can't have that all the time you can't be that creative and have that much energy all the time it's just uh it's like a season it's like the seasons yeah, like yeah. just accept you know, don't don't really call it depression just call it like a the autumn you know call, give it a, right, give it a, right, give right. it a name uh-huh. like it's not necessarily negative not necessarily negative it may, may feel negative so this is actually a really interesting point that we bring up like these negative feelings versus positive feelings uh i'll go off on a little tangent here so <laughs> when we look in the finance world at the stock market um there are almost as many up days in the stock market as there are down days and humans it's just human nature where losses hurt more than gains feel good. So yeah. if we talk about on a day in the stock market, you lose $100, that hurts more than a day feels good when you win $100. So over the course of time, if there are just as many up days as down days, uh, people end up hurting a lot more if they're looking at their stocks on a daily basis, uh, even though over time the stock market goes up. Um, yeah. So people end up making like these hasty decisions because of that. They, it hurts so much that they sell too early. But anyway, I guess what I'm saying here is that like you need to be able to look at losses or negatives very objectively, or at least try to match that feeling with an equal uh, gain. I know, like on, on like on Amazon, when I look at my reviews on Amazon, mm-hmm. I've got like I think on on one of them I've got like seven like seventy something reviews, and nearly all of them are four or five stars. But I always dwell on the one which mm-hmm. is like the the two stars, like, why did he bother writing this? Oh, this is terrible. And, and, uh, yeah, but you just, you just focus sometimes just on the negatives uh-huh. and to forget about, you forget about how amazing your life is, you know, that you, that, that you have, you, you're lucky enough to stress about the fact that, you know, are you going to go to Alaska? Are you going to go to Tuolumne? And like, where most people don't have that, they're just, right. um, yeah. So it's, but then it, it, it's all relative, isn't it? Like, this is the life you lead. Mm-hmm. Don't feel guilty about, the re- the reality of your life, you know. So it's a uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting, really. 
Let's change it up a little bit. We'll go to your gear recommendation, Andy. <laughs> uh, we like to get a gear recommendation from every guest that we are lucky enough to have join us on the show. Uh, you talk a lot about gear on your blog. Give our listeners something that they have to have. One thing I've, I've, I use quite a lot and I give to people to use is something like a, you know, like a, a Petzl reverse or four, like a, like a belay device. Mm-hmm. Um, it has like so many, all these different functions. And uh, I think I climb a lot of people who are getting on a bit. So you're, you're able to belay without bending over, hmm. uh, which is good if you've got a bad back. So I think that's, that's, probably, that's probably one. Like, I, quite, I, quite like, I quite like sort of simple gear and gear that's like a, like a clothing. For me, it's all about, all about your survivability. Like, are you more survivable with this or with that? So um, and maybe, maybe clothing-wise, I use this uh, Montaigne, like a UK company. They make this stuff called, um, it's called Extreme smock and it's like a a thick fiber pile sort of shelled kind of uh smock and there's like a jacket and i i I, I use that quite a lot because it's you know it can be just completely saturated with water and it keeps you warm and um so i always feel like kind of increases your survivability i like it increases your (laughs) survivability for the listeners, those resources, the smock and the Petzl belay device on Andy's Meister profile page. Finally, Andy, we'd like to hear who you'd like to hear as the next person on this show. You're today's Mountain Meister. Who's the next one? I don't know if he's been on it already, but um, the kayaker, John Turk. Oh, good answer. Yeah. Tell our listeners about John. Um, like I met, I met John in, in at the BAM Film Festival. We were on the write, a writing program together, mm-hmm. and uh, he is like the word legend is you know. <laughs> well, I guess he's a legend because very few people, as well in the UK, have ever heard of him. But he he's kayaked from Japan to Alaska and uh, uh, from across to Greenland and um, around Cape Horn, and done all these amazing uh, trips in his life, and is a quantum physicist and has been healed by shamans and he's a yeah an amazing an amazing uh speaker as well like a a lot of interesting stories to tell excellent for the listeners keep an eye out for john on a future episode of mountain meister andy really enjoyed talking to you today a lot of fun (laughs) <laughs> good, good. To, I like talking about myself. So. For the listeners, you can check out more about Andy at andy-kirkpatrick.com. You can also find highlights of today's episode on our website, mtnmeister.com. Andy, any more plans for the rest of the day? Uh, I'm just about to go climbing, actually. Cool. Was, yeah, and the, the sun's shining here, so it's uh, yeah, off climbing now. For once, the sun is shining in the UK. Yeah, (laughs) not for long. Thanks so much. Great talking. Thank you, everyone, for listening to that episode with Andy Kirkpatrick. Don't forget that we are supported by the DeLorme InReach Explorer. It's the world's only satellite communicator with built-in navigation. Send and receive text messages, create waypoints, and find your way back from anywhere in the entire world for $35 off of your purchase. Go to inreachdelorme.com and use the code MEISTER at checkout. As always, enjoy doing the rest of whatever you do when you listen to this podcast. Exciting things are coming soon to Mountain Meister. Stay tuned for that as we approach our one-year anniversary. Until then, I'm your host, Ben Shank.